Good morning and welcome to another episode of our Ocean County Parks live Facebook nature series where we bring the nature to you in the comfort of your own home. Um, so my name is Megan Zorns, Senior Park Naturalist here at the Cooper Environmental Center at Caddis Island County Park. Um, so for the past few episodes, we've been talking about reptiles, and we absolutely love our reptiles, our turtles and snakes, but today we're going to change it up a little bit. Um, so we're going to be talking about a species that has been on this earth for the past 450 million years. Um, so this is actually a living fossil that we have today, and we're going to be talking about Atlantic horseshoe crabs. So we're gonna dig in here and bring out our little buddies. Kaylin, you're a little shy. Oops. So here we have our horseshoe crab. So a horseshoe crab gets its name from obviously the shape of its shell, but despite being called a horseshoe crab, they are more closely related to ticks, scorpions, and spiders. I like to think of them as a giant water bug. So you can see he's trying to crawl around here. And they can be out of water for quite a long time, up to several days. So he's not in any danger being out of the water right now. So when you look at them, at first they might seem a little bit intimidating. They've got all these little pointy and prickly edges, and you'll probably notice this long tail. And you'll think, all right, well, if it's related to a scorpion, can that tail sting me? And the answer is no. So horseshoe crabs are completely harmless to humans. They just look kind of spiky and scary at first glance. So they do have a carapace, like a turtle. So this top shell protects them from predators. It's nice and hard, and it's made of a material called chitin. It's that same material that makes up our hair and our fingernails. So um, they are actually invertebrates, though. So Turtles have um, skeletons on the inside of our body, as well as, as us, and invertebrates don't have a backbone or a spine. So instead, they have their skeleton on the outside of their body, and it's called an exoskeleton. So just like bugs, they have to molt or shed that exoskeleton in order to grow. So here we have one of the molts, probably this guy right here. So I'm going to put our live horseshoe crab down just for a second. So you can see this, this exoskeleton. So if I pull this apart here, you can see that they slip right out of that exoskeleton when they molt. So when they're done molting, they're going to be a little bit squishy and vulnerable. So when they're, when they're in that state, they need to go somewhere to hide so they don't get, so they don't get harmed. So they'll find somewhere quiet, somewhere safe, where they can wait for that, that shell to harden up again. So let's take a look at the underside of our horseshoe crab. So they don't really like being on their backs too much. You can see they use that tail to right themselves up and they'll use it to steer as well. So all these little claws are going. Now it looks like it might, might hurt a little bit. They have all these pinchers. It actually kind of tickles. So the, the little claws don't hurt at all. They're not very strong and they've got six pairs of legs. So the first pair of legs, if you can see those teeny tiny little pinchers right there, those are called chelicerae. And that just means those are the little legs that grab onto their food. And the other five pairs of legs that they have are called pedipalps. And they use those to move along the seafloor. And when they move, they kind of look like a little Roomba. And you'll get to see that in a little bit. They also have gills. They're called book gills. And he's closing up because he feels a little bit vulnerable right now. He's closing up that shell as much as he can. But you can see those are those gills right there that allow them to breathe underwater. And as long as those gills stay moist, they can be out of water for, for quite a long time. So he's in no danger here. So let's flip our little, our little guy to the other side. And another fascinating thing about horseshoe crabs is how many eyes they have. So you can see those two big eyes on either side, and those are the most powerful eyes that they have. So they have 10 eyes in total. Those compound eyes that we can see easily right there are used for finding mates. So when they come up to the shore to breed, they'll use those eyes to kind of get, a, get an idea of what's going on in their surroundings. So those are compound eyes. If you've ever seen a picture 
of a, a fly's eye. It almost looks like a disco ball. So they can get a nice wide range of images of what's going on around them. So those are their, their strong eyes right there. And the rest of their eyes are really so tiny, especially on a little guy like this, that you won't be able to, to really see them. But they have two more eyes right below their compound eye. And those are used to sense light. And at the top here, there's another cluster of three more eyes right in that little, that little ridge right there. And those three eyes are used to detect ultraviolet light from the sun and light that reflects off the moon because they are nocturnal, so they need to be able to, to find their way around on the beach at nighttime. They have another group of eyes on their tail. And those are photoreceptors. And that just means that they take in light and it lets the crab know what time of day it is. So if there's not so much light going on, those photoreceptors will tell the crab's brain that the compound eyes need to be more sensitive. So just like when your pupils dilate when it's nighttime to let more light in, those eyes on their tail will tell the eyes on their head that they need to take in more light. And their last set of eyes are on the underside. And they've got a pair of eyes right there, and they're so tiny you probably can't even notice them. But those eyes on the bottom help the crab to kind of orient themselves in the water and also to find their food, which will be little snails and slugs, tiny little shrimp and mollusks. Um, they don't, they, they're scavengers for the most part, so they just kind of move along the seafloor and picking up scraps as they find them. So our horseshoe crabs are only a few years old. They're still very small. They will molt up to 18 times throughout their life, and then they stop molting once they're adults. So they reach adulthood at about 10 years of age, and they'll live for about 20 years in the wild. So the, the females will molt a few times more than the males because they, they are larger. And they'll grow to about maybe 20 inches from head to tail, with the males being a little smaller. Now you've probably heard me refer to this guy as either he or she throughout this talk because we're not sure what gender um, this horseshoe crab is. You really can't tell until they reach that adult stage. And at that point, the males will get a pair of what look like little boxing gloves on their, on their front claws. And those are used to hook onto the females during the mating process. So usually around the end of May or the beginning of June, during a full moon, they will come up from the, the deeper waters. It's called a local migration. So they'll come up from the deeper waters and come onto shore, and they will have their, they will, they will breed once they're on the shore. So the females are going to deposit their eggs anywhere between 10 and 30,000 eggs. It's a lot of little eggs. And then they'll, they'll bury them in the sand a couple of inches, and then the males will use those little hooks, those little boxing gloves, to hang onto the shell of the female. So they'll have multiple males hanging onto the female at one time, which is why she needs to be bigger, a little bit stronger to drag them around. Now it's, they fertilize their eggs externally on the outside. So the female will lay her eggs, and as she moves along in the sand, the males are going to um, release the sperm, and that will fertilize the eggs in the sand. So those eggs are a really important food source for nesting or migrating shorebirds. So um, in New Jersey, Atlantic horseshoe crabs are considered a near threatened species. So they're not quite endangered yet, but they're um, some, a species that we need to, to look out for. Um, so because they take such a long time to reach uh, the reproductive age, so 10 years is a long time for an animal um, to reach adulthood in, a wild, in the wild. So they need to um, be protected in order to keep their numbers healthy. They've survived um, multiple mass extinctions throughout history. And only now, um, with, with humans causing them some problems, are, the, are they running into a little bit of trouble. So they're highly prized as bait for conchant eel fishermen. So that has been um, a reason. For Another reason is that they're very valuable for medical research. So if you haven't heard, um, horseshoe crabs actually have blue blood. So that blue color comes from all of the copper that's in their blood, and it has some, some really interesting properties. So they can be harvested um, to extract their blood, 
And then um, the blood can be used to um, identify if maybe drugs or medical equipment is contaminated with bacteria because that blood has a clotting agent. So it will kind of bind up if there's any bacteria contaminating that medical equipment, um, it, it will let us know that you know, it's, it's no good. Um, so their blood is definitely prized um, in the medical industry. So what they do is they'll extract the blood from the horseshoe crabs and they do release the crabs back into the ocean, um, but you know they don't they don't feel so well after that. So it's, imagine you giving blood, you might feel a little tired, a little under the weather for a day or two, and that's what happens to most of the crabs. But sometimes they they don't make it through that stressful process. So that's another reason that that their numbers are declining. So horse um, the horseshoe crab eggs are an excellent food source for over 11 species of shorebirds. And you can actually um, take a trip. We'll see what we'll see what happens, you know, with everything that's going on. But we run a trip um, every year to the Delaware Bay shore to watch this migration of shorebirds. So they are flying all the way down, for, or they're flying up from the southern tip of South America, and they're trying to reach their breeding grounds up in the Arctic. So the, um, the New Jersey Delaware Bay shore is kind of like a stopover for them to refuel. So they're going for those nutrient-rich crab eggs, and that's why they, they lay so many, because they are a food source. So some of them will be food for the shorebirds, and other, um, other eggs will make it so the, the crabs can hatch and reach adulthood. But um, if there aren't enough eggs, those shorebirds aren't going to have enough fuel to make it that 3,000 plus mile journey all the way to the Arctic. Um, so they need to be able to fatten up and refuel, and Without the horseshoe crabs, they're unable to do that. So let's just take a look at this little guy here. I'm gonna put him in the water, or her, we're not sure yet, so you guys can take a look at how they swim. Now, I said they're nocturnal, so they don't really like being out in this bright light too much. So he's just gonna bury himself in the sand. And you can see those legs moving, digging, in the, dig, digging into the sand. And that's a little grass shrimp that's coming up. The grass shrimp know that when I'm here, it's food time, so they're, they're probably waiting for their lunch. We've got some other critters in this tank as well. So the shrimp kind of clean up the place. We have a little, little, little horseshoe crab. This is how small they are when we first got them. For some reason, this little guy, we're not sure if he's not eating so well, or maybe he was just the, the runt of, of the group but we got this little guy the same time as our other crab. But you can see it's just about the size of a quarter. A little tiny, there's those little legs underneath, and they all have that instinct to kind of close up when we flip them over. All right, we're gonna pop him back in. Now if you guys have, whoop, now we can watch that tail flip the crab over. There they use that tail, come on. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> Maybe needs a little hand. Come on. Come on. He'd get it eventually, but I'm going to give him a little help because I flipped him in the first place. There we go. And he's just going to burrow under there. So if you guys have any questions, you can leave them in the comments section and I'll answer them, um, you know, this afternoon. And we're going to have another presentation this Friday about our osprey. And they have arrived here, so Miss um, Nikki will be here to talk to you about those. Um, and thanks for watching again, and we'll see you next time.